If this isn't the strangest course of events leading up to a product review, I don't know what is. Today we're going to take an in-depth look at what some are claiming to be the most powerful Android device on the market today. Before we talk about that though, I do have to address the huge elephant in the room. Most of the people watching this video know that I don't really like GPD right now. I have a Discord server with a channel specifically dedicated to pointing out some of the garbage stuff that their marketing team has done in the past that others don't like to talk about, and if the person behind those actions asked me to review this device, I would have told them to fly a kite. The boss of GPD contacted me out of the blue a week ago and asked if I wanted to review this device. And if I can say nothing else, at least to my knowledge, he has never attacked me by name in public, which is not something that I can say about every company. The sales of this device aren't that great right now, and this could completely blow up in his face, but I'm going to make a promise to all of you. I'm already blacklisted by GPD over videos that I did about the Ioneo and the Win 3, and that isn't going to change if I magically give this device a glowing review. I also have nothing to gain by making a video bashing this, and despite what many people would lead you to believe in some circles, I don't purposely diss products just to get back at companies. If you ever needed a clear example of that, this is the video. If this product is garbage, I'm going to let you know. If it is a good product, I will also let you know. That is what I can promise. Oddly enough, I have had the first GPD XP device in my possession for a long time, and I did plan on doing a review for it, but I never got around to it. Thankfully, GPD decided to use a more powerful processor this time around, and the difference between the two devices is night and day. The XP comes with the D1200 SoC and a 134 configuration, with four Cortex A55 cores clocked at two gigahertz, three Cortex A78 cores clocked at 2.6 gigahertz, and one Prime A78 core clocked at three gigahertz. Our GPU is a Mali G77 MC9 clocked at 886 megahertz, and we have six gigabytes of LPDDR4X RAM. My model came with 128 gigabytes of UFS 3.1 storage, but there is a 256 gigabyte option available. We have a 7,000 milliamp hour battery, a 6.81 inch IPS display with a resolution of 1080 by 2400, and we have Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2 for connectivity. All of this is running on Android 11. When it comes to benchmarks, we have a single core score of 850 and a multi-core score of 2498. For Vulkan, we have a score of 5792 and an OpenCL score of 5716. Our Vulkan score with the wildlife test clocks in at 4312. I also went ahead and did some storage benchmarks, and we have decent read and write speeds with the onboard storage. In this first section, I want to go over the controls and modules of the XP. With this product, you have three configurations that you can use. You can use this default controller, which is the one that I use for everything and never take off. But you also have a flat panel. I never use this and I find it kind of pointless. Depending on the type of game you're playing, the third module can be nice. You have five buttons on the front, plus R1 and R2, but the R2 button is a bit dinky because it's this half height thing. If you think about it this way, you have five buttons on the front plus two in the back for a total of seven. If you compare that to the main controller, you have six buttons on the front, not including the R3, plus your two buttons on the back. If you include R3, you have a total of nine buttons, and you're only adding a bit of extra length to the device that you'd have to reach over if you wanted to touch the screen. For this and one other reason that I'll talk about later, I rarely use this attachment over the main one in MOBAs or other Android games. All this just brings me to the point that this main controller should just be part of the device and there should be no modularity to this device at all. If they had done that, you'd be looking at a device with a 10,000 to 12,000 milliamp hour battery and that would be absolutely nuts. Given all of that, let's go over the main control set now with my preferred attachment. You have two analog sticks with a decent range of motion and you also have a D-pad, a set of Android function buttons at the top that I like, and you have start and select on the other side. Let's take a second to talk about the D-pad. As you can see, it is styled after the Vita D-pad, and I've seen a lot of people who talk about this that are fans of the Vita. They see this and say the Vita D-pad is great, and it looks like the Vita D-pad, ergo it must be awesome, but unfortunately, this isn't very close to the feeling of a Vita D-pad at all. It's awkwardly a bit taller than it should be, and it lacks some of the play that you'd get when you press a Vita D-pad. If this was a Vita and you pressed in this direction, you would press down on the switch under the button and there would still be some slight play to work with before you couldn't move any further. The clearest example where you'd notice this difference would be if you were to move around in all the different directions. You'd have a more comfortable experience on the Vita compared to how it is on this device. I don't have my Vita right now, but if you are a Vita owner, I think you can see what I'm talking about by doing this action for yourself. If we compare this button to the ABXY buttons, I think those are closer to the look and feel of the ones on a Vita. That's not to say that the D-pad is bad per se, 
It's just not the holy grail that people are making it out to be. If you've used a Vita before, there's no way this is going to fool you and make you think it's a proper clone. As a side, I'll also point out that pivoting isn't as good as it could be with this button. It feels like it has a center post because it doesn't bottom out in all directions as the i7s could, but it leaves a lot to be desired. Because this isn't shipping for another two months, they could improve this if they wanted. I won't say fix because it's not broken, but it isn't as good as it could be with some minor tweaks to the button mold. As I said, the ABXY buttons are pretty faithful to the Vita experience. I don't have any problems with these, I just wish that they were a bit wider. They are essentially the same size as they are on the Vita, but because this device is large, it would have been nice to get some bigger buttons here, especially if they went with conductive rubber. The start and select buttons are a single piece, and I like them. You can easily rock between them, or use them both at the same time, and they are easy to press. The only other button that I haven't mentioned is the screen mapping button on the left side, and we'll talk more about that later in the video. That leaves us with our two analog sticks, and I think it's safe to say that these are the best analog sticks in any Android device. These are great for precise input thanks to their large range of motion, and this plays a part in any system that you emulate that used a controller with a similar set of analog sticks. That being said, I think they could still dial these in a bit better in the software to improve them. These aren't Hall Effect whatever, but that doesn't really matter as they are already very good. If you're used to console controllers, you'll be right at home with these. One problem that I have found is that the casing around the analog stick base has some wear to it from rubbing against the shell. This is just something to be aware of because this isn't after any extensive use, and it isn't something that you'll feel while using the stick. My right stick has been used even less, and it doesn't have nearly the same wear on it. I also want to point out that this device suffers from the same problem that the Switch has where your thumb will hit or constantly rest on the analog stick when you are trying to press the A button in retro games. This is compounded by the fact that these buttons sit lower and are smaller, so it could get annoying in some retro games. Thankfully, the cap is easy to remove, and if you find yourself having issues with this, you could just remove it for those retro games that you want to play. Now I want to talk about the shoulder buttons, but I just have to mention that my case is open right now. I'm going to talk more about that later in the video, I just don't want people to think that this is how the device came to me. All of our shoulder buttons are digital buttons, so you're not going to get any kind of analog R2 and L2 action on this like you do with the Odin, but for the most part, these are good buttons. I'm a big fan of the L1 and R1 buttons, and I think these are easily better than the ones in Odin by far. They are soft to press like the ones in the Switch, and the same can be said about the R2 and L2 buttons. The bottom of our device has a set of stereo speakers, a Type-C port with DisplayPort functionality, and a combo SIM card and SD card tray. On the corner, you have a headphone jack and a microphone. Let's move on to talk about the case on this. I've mentioned this at length in other videos, but I'm not the biggest fan of GPD's paint that they use on all their products. I think the XP in an all-white or matte black shell would look sick, but we're left with this, you know, speckled metallic plastic paint because it's the only color in GPD's world. I've also mentioned that I'm not the biggest fan of the plastic formula that GPD uses. It doesn't feel as robust as this product could, and I don't mean robust as in it could take a fall. The last time I brought this up, GPD said they are using some aerospace plastic formula, but that doesn't really matter to me in a gaming device, and weight isn't a concern for me on this one. I can just say that it's average. While we're on the topic of the case, I do want to mention one gripe that I have with this. It doesn't affect me that much because I always leave my device fully assembled, but the inside piece on these attachments isn't polished, so it slightly grinds on the case when you slide them into place. This is the biggest problem with this middle section because that's the roughest point on these attachments. Since modularity is the main point of this product, it doesn't feel as premium as it could if they had polished this inside piece. That being said, that's just a minor gripe. So when you've got the device in your hand, it feels really good. You've got ergonomics on the left and the right side with the back grips, but you've also got rounded corners here so there's nothing sharp poking into your hand, and your fingers will naturally go where they need to. There's also no significant flex in this device when you try to warp it, and this is with the screws off, so this should be like our worst case scenario. You don't have any play here with this not locked down, because they've got this very firm ridge here. The only play that you'd have is with the back panel by itself, but there are no negative structural elements that I'm noticing. So, let's talk about this screen here. Obviously, this is not a new design, so a lot of these things have already been said in other places. We have an extra large screen with a hole punch camera in the corner, and for the record, I have disconnected this and you can do the same for yourself. To play devil's advocate, I will just say that it's easier to get a good screen like this with a hole punch camera than it is to get a good 16x9 screen. In this kind of size range, 
you would typically get much older technology if you're going to limit yourself to a 16 by 9 screen. Most of those older screens that still have stock are going to have bad saturation, low contrast ratios, and potentially bad color temperature. This screen is not bad. The colors are good and the brightness is also decent. The only negative here is that our minimum level isn't that low. So if you look at the minimum brightness compared to something like this, this screen seems like it's off in this video. They probably could have gone a bit lower than this if they wanted. It's like one of those things that you're only focused on if someone brings it to your attention. And for me, it would have been better if they could go lower than this. That being said, the maximum brightness setting is completely fine. I will also point out that there seems to be some slight stutter in the video signal. The only system where I found this to cause any problems was RA, and I was able to fix that by adjusting the refresh rate value. Audio quality is another thing that I want to go over. They don't have the best bass in the world, but they are pretty good on the high end. They can also get reasonably loud at their highest setting. The lowest value is also pretty decent. The only negative that I'm noticing is that they don't have a robust low end. Here are some audio samples for you to judge. I was about to do some audio recordings of the fan when I noticed that the volume is still coming out of the device. This is a bug that GPD told me they're already aware of after I filmed this video. As for the fan, you have three settings that you can choose from. The low setting is somewhat near the sound of a switch fan under heavy load, and the high setting is a bit louder than that. Here's an audio recording so you can hear how it sounds. Part of the reason why I don't want to use the other attachments is you'd have to press this area of the screen. It is very hot to the touch at max brightness. This isn't meant to be a scientific measure, but you can see the difference between the right side of the device and the middle. I don't think they have any significant heat dissipation going on from the left to the right side, but I haven't dismantled the screen to find out. This is not an abnormal temperature for a screen to get to, but the difference is that you'd usually see it on phones with a metal frame that absorbs and spreads out the heat more evenly than this. Right now, there's almost a 20C spread from the left to the right side. You don't feel any of that heat on the main controller that I use, but you would feel it by using the MOBA attachment. While we're on the topic of cooling, I think that this cooling system is pretty decent. All things considered, the fan is a better fan than the fan that's inside Odin. This uses less power than the one in Odin, and they have a straightforward path from the heat generated here going directly out through the top. The problem is that the way that you've seen this device in videos from the company and other reviewers is not as good as this device can be. What you've already seen is garbage performance out of this processor. And I noticed that right when I got this device. I have put together this example to illustrate what I mean. You can see by our reading on the top that we are at 1x resolution and everything here is optimal. You might not see VU here, but it doesn't work on this chip. We have 23-ish FPS, and I just want to show you with VU on in case anybody thinks that these settings are wrong. There is no difference. It's still garbage, and it's even worse with that option on. Now the strange thing is, these same settings can work on the D900, and I just did a huge video on that, so it's still fresh in my mind. This processor has more cores than that does, and they're at higher frequencies. This should outperform the Odin Lite by far, and it doesn't. So at this point, I asked the boss of GPD if he could give me user debug or root access to this because I knew that there was a ton of potential that they had not yet tapped. He got back to me with a root patch and seemed very surprised and happy when he saw the results that I showed him. So I want to now show you what I showed him. Before we do that, I want to enable the frequencies to show on screen so you can see the difference. You can see that our charge current fluctuates around one amp to get this bad performance here. The CPU clocks are doing jack and there's nothing you can do to get them to go higher than this by default. Once I had root access, I did the same thing I did on the Odin Lite. You can see our performance increased significantly. We're still at 1x here, but we can go much higher than this. 2x is also fine. We're using significantly more power now, so that's going to be the trade-off. The battery in here is huge, so that's not a problem in my opinion. If we take this to 3x, you can see that we're at 26 FPS. If we were to move to a different area, we can get full speed performance at 3x resolution. It's just that area that I was in is more demanding. You really wouldn't see this kind of performance unless you had a Snapdragon 855 or better. So yeah, I think GBD is excited because they gave this device to me with like a sub 1% chance that they would get any benefit at all. And they just found out that the device that they've been marketing for months is much better than they thought. Like who would have thought 
that GBD giving me their device to review would end up with their device being better. This is how I know I'm in the cursed timeline. I just can't get over how lucky these guys are because I almost didn't bother to ask them for root access to film this video, but the curiosity was eating away at me and I had to know how much performance they were leaving on the table. They essentially got a free upgrade in utilizing more of the R&D that they already paid for and I am super jealous. These kind of performance swings don't happen in this market. Unfortunately, even though using the CPU in this way is beneficial across the board for most emulators, it has one negative downside where it puts a huge strain on the CPU. Even though the fan is doing a great job right now and I don't even notice the heat, the temperature inside the shell starts to build up after 10 minutes or so and it can get to the point where the CPU will get to the junction temperature and it will just kill the power to the processor. So, GPD decided to modify the back of the shell to add an air vent over the fan which completely negates this issue. And like hats off to them for doing that because this is actually the right thing to do in this situation and those lucky bastards found out about this early enough that they can fully take advantage of it. Because I don't have that vent, I have slightly opened up my shell to increase airflow, which is why you see that my device is not completely put together. Without this change, the performance of this device was garbage. It was just marginally worse or better depending on the situation than the Odin Lite, and the Odin Lite is marginally better than the Odin and the Odin Pro in most situations, with the only downside being that it has significantly less utility when it comes to software. This device is now better than those when it comes to emulation. When you use this performance mode, battery life is gonna take a huge dive. On the Odin Lite, the device still sips power when it's run like this because it only has two performance cores, but this guy can drop to three amps under the heaviest load that I've seen, which would give you between two to three hours of battery life on the worst case scenario that you could find. The device will fully recharge within that time, so you'd get a one-to-one -one use in that situation. We haven't talked about the software yet, and for the most part, you're getting a pretty basic platform here without any bells and whistles. There's a customized launcher that comes with the device called G-Box, but mine gave up on life and doesn't want to work right now, so I'm just using the default Android launcher, which is perfect for my use. GBD is also bringing its screen mapping software to the table with this product, and it also lacks some of the bells and whistles that you'd see in the controller software from other companies, but it gets the job done in most situations. I just don't like that you can't remove the buttons from the screen that you don't need, and I also don't like that you can't make these buttons smaller because sometimes it is very hard to map these correctly to small UI elements. The final point that I want to make is that you're not able to change the right analog that controls your view in 3D games. As I already told you, I would much rather use the default controller for everything on this device and just forget that the other attachments exist, but this software flaw makes it very difficult to enjoy games like PUBG. The problem is that any pop-up window that you see in this game takes place in the exact location of this right analog button that you are not able to move, which breaks your ability to move when you are picking up items in this game. I brought this problem to their attention, and they said to just use the MOBA attachment instead of this one, but like, I don't want to. I just want to use this one. This is the better controller. I shouldn't be forced to use that attachment to play this game. You should just, you know, let me change the change view button since it's the only one out of the thousand that are on screen that you locked for some reason. I hope after seeing this explanation that they unlock that button because it doesn't make a lot of sense for hardware companies selling you hardware to lock down their software in this way, especially when it has clear negative impacts. Before we move on, I just wanna show what the back of the device looks like with the high performance option enabled after a PUBG match. It's really not bad. Now it's finally time to see what this hole punch monster can do when it comes to emulation. In doing this, I'm not gonna fault this device for having a 20 by nine aspect ratio because this kind of stuff doesn't bother me on gaming phones that I use. Even though it's not ideal, I wouldn't say it's a deal breaker when we can use widescreen hacks in most of the popular emulators. The first system that we're gonna look at that can fill out the screen nicely is PS1 with the Duck Station emulator. We have the rendering resolution set to 5X for 1080p and we are using PGXP. Next up, here's N64 with the Mupin 64 Plus Core. We have the resolution set to 1080p with the wide adjusted setting.
Here's Dreamcast performance with the Flycast Core. We have the resolution set to 1440p, and we are using widescreen hacks. Now let's move over to PSP, and we are going to upscale these games to 5x native resolution. The XP Plus is also capable of some 3DS emulation, but you are still going to run into some shader compilation stuttering the first time you see an effect go out in some games. Depending on the game, we can push this up to 4x native resolution. In this next section, we're going to look at GameCube and Wii performance with the Dolphin emulator. We are using widescreen hacks, and we have the resolution set to 3x native for 1080p. We have two systems left, and both of them are systems that take full advantage of our newfound performance. When it comes to PS2, you are going to get decent performance in most games, especially when you up the resolution, but it doesn't mean you won't experience some slowdowns in demanding parts of the game.
service provided by Gadget Monster. <laughs> For the last system, we have Switch with the Skyline emulator. This device could potentially do more emulation than what I can showcase in this video if it had more than 6 gigabytes of RAM. Skyline is your best bet when it comes to Switch emulation at this point, but there might be some games that currently do not run on Skyline that you'd have to either not play at all or use a different emulator to play. Let's go over the pros and cons of the XP Plus. On the pro side, there are a bunch of things that I like about this device. It has very good analog sticks with a good range of motion. The screen is bright at the maximum setting and the saturation is good. The emulation performance is above any Android handheld right now with the new performance settings. The cooling system is decent and the fan noise is not too bad at the highest setting. It has good ergonomics with good R1 and L1 triggers. And finally, the internal mechanical design is very professional. Now let's talk about the cons. First and foremost, I'm not a big fan of the modular design and I don't think it was worth giving up space for a significantly bigger battery in this product just to accommodate a second controller attachment with limited use. Bass frequencies could be a bit better with more fine tuning done to the audio DSP and I also think the D-pad could be improved if they wanted. I would have liked if the ABXY buttons were a bit wider or were a bit taller to make them easier to press with the right analog situation that I've already talked about. And this is just my personal preference speaking, but the color option is probably the biggest con for me with this device. I wish GPD would add more colors to their color palette and stop using this one on everything they make because this would have been a much sleeker product in matte black or all white. We could put the hole punch camera here because it is a con, but I can at least see where GVD is coming from with this, and I've already spoken about the screen itself. This device was marketed to MOBA gamers in China, and you need facial verification to play most popular games these days, and that needs a camera. It doesn't have to be a camera in the display, but you do need a camera. I've unplugged my camera, and I can just say I never think about it when I'm using this device. Wrapping up with the all important question of would I buy this device and that's going to be a difficult one because I own so many Odin devices at this point. I certainly don't need another one, but I'm happy that I have this one. I just wish that GPD would have come in with a more aggressive price. I think this is going for 339 on the lowest model, but I know for a fact that they could have priced this in the 200s if they wanted. Maybe they know something that I don't. If you had the choice of selling let's say 1000 devices at a given profit level that you were comfortable with, or you could get the same profit by selling 5,000 or 10,000 devices, which would you choose? I think some people would want the bigger user base and all that comes with it, but maybe you just want to sell a smaller number of units to have less headache. What I can say is that this device is much better than the XP that came before it. That device is absolute trash compared to the XP Plus, especially when you factor in how much it was to buy. If you think about it this way, this is like $100 more than what people pay for an RK3399 handheld today. For only 50% more money, you are getting like 5x the functionality with the ability to use this as a phone. Obviously Odin is cheaper, but that doesn't mean this device is bad. Anyway, that's my take on the XP Plus and it wasn't the one that I thought I was going to make when I opened the box. Life is full of surprises. Happy gaming everyone. Talk you out.